I'm here to talk about uh, using the tools of identity to solve the problems of security. Um, what do I really mean by that, right? So let's first sort of look at the macro problem or a series of problems that create this need to better integrate identity and security. Right, so clearly every year these numbers increase from a spend perspective. I think I heard in one of the sessions even yesterday, right, that that 90 billion is now gonna move to you know, 200 billion or 120 billion in the next um, two to three years. Yet breaches continue to increase every year. I, you know, obviously um, last year's report said and there was a 40% increase, I'm sure this year it will say 50% increase or 55% increase. Meanwhile, our ways to protect against those breaches is to apply greater friction to the authentication process. So there was a survey done by um, Tech Trends. A few hundred respondents came back and 56% said, hey, listen, we, we do protect some of our resources with the second factor, uh, but not all of our enterprise resources. Um, and, and typically that reason ends up being back to user friction or not wanting to apply user friction. Yet we know that the Verizon breach report tells us 81% of those breaches have something to do in that attack path relative, relevant to a credential. The amount of time that attackers live within our world continues to, to go down, but even at 146 days on average, uh, it's still an extremely long time for an attacker to, to dwell and move laterally within our environments to execute their jobs. And we know that the SOC is overwhelmed with thousands of incidents per day. And, and we know from an identity perspective that many of them can be correlated and tied to identities. It just isn't necessarily done on any scale of regularity within the SOC and SIM solutions today. So what I want to focus on is sort of the the, the how do we, why do we live in this, why do we live in this sort of breach, breach a day type first world? And it seems to be because the hunting grounds are just so fertile, right? There are, in our opinion, sort of four reasons that drive the success for attackers. The first being more and more apps are made available within organizations every day. In fact, it isn't even an IT function anymore. It, it's um, you know, I was up here yesterday with Matt Connors from um, University of New Hampshire sys uh, school systems and, 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 and he said, listen, we have 36 SaaS apps today, we had three last year, right? So our business just buys them and then brings them to us and says, oh, by the way, can you plug this into my current username and password? Um, he suspects they'll have over 60 uh, next year. So more apps are becoming more available, which then puts our data in more places on-prem in the cloud, any hybrid amount of in between there. There's more places for attackers to monetize our data today effectively. Um, I, I'll say a few years ago, I won't put a number to it because I don't really remember what year I read the study, right? It was the way that attackers monetized our, our data then was really selling credit card information on the dark web. You know, now simply they can sell for $100 or $120 a good username and password on the dark web, and the problem is they can sell thousands of them at once, right? So the, it's, it's, a, it's a wide open commodity on the dark web to monetize is very easy. And oh, by the way, we have more access to more people. Every customer I talk to is, is, is growing from a B2B, B2E, B2C, and or some alumni perspective of that B2C affiliation, right? They, they seem to be managing more and more users and more and more repositories uh, as things grow. So. What I'd like to focus on kind of in a little more in depth in this four areas is really the apps examples and the people examples. So here's why it's, I don't know, so easy for attackers, right? I, I will put myself in this category. Clearly humans are the weakest link. So the links here, I know you guys probably can't see them the way the resolution is. There are four different links. I don't know if you guys get access to the content or not from where all this, from where all the research information came from. Um, but Phishing attempts were up 65% last year. 76% of the folks who responded to the survey reported being a phishing victim of some sort last year. With 30% of those resulting in, hey, I opened a message. And 12% said, hey, I clicked on a link. Now listen, like that's a supposedly anonymous survey and 12% admitted they clicked. I gotta imagine the numbers are probably more like 20, 30, 40% clicked the link. They just didn't really wanna 
click the link saying, hey, yes, I clicked the link. <laughs> right? they, they weren't sure how anonymized that data really was. Um, but nonetheless, clearly humans become the easiest way for attackers to gain access to valid credentials through phishing, and phishing has become much more sophisticated. And, oh, by the way, humans pick extremely weak passwords. And listen, I didn't believe, so I don't know if Damon's not in here. So I asked my marketing guys to help us aggregate research to put into our presentations, and he came back and said, hey, here's the top 25 passwords in 2017. I said, like, there's no way that we still have passwords that are one, two, three, four, five, six. So then I had to Google it to make sure, right? So I just typed in top password survey report 2017, and sure enough, like, this list is, is again, I would assume stuffed in credentials, stuffed in code, not necessarily just purely end user passwords, because most of us have complexity rules that prevent simple passwords like that. But nonetheless, we all know we pick weak passwords. Another tech trend survey done last year, respondents came back saying 87% of them said, yes, I reuse my password because I get tired of managing passwords. And that was ages 18 to 30. And then the, the results were pretty similar for, for 31 and up. And then 81% of those folks responded saying, yes, I reuse passwords. Uh, I think when I saw this data during our survey, I went back and tried to reanalyze how many accounts I manage on my own today as myself. And I probably have over 40. Uh, so I, I admit there is some um, amount of reuse in, in my own world. I have kind of said, hey, for this collection of apps that I really don't care, I'll use the same password, but then I won't mix it with my corporate password. And this set of apps will all have individual passwords. I have become my own sort of password wallet. Uh, the forgot your password link is my common second factor credential, because frankly, I can't remember most of those passwords, so I just go through a reset exercise each time. The number of passwords and credentials available on the dark web is, is to me, staggering. Just looking at these numbers from last year, and again, we just picked these four breaches based on the amount of incident, the amount of um, exposed PII, 3.7 billion credentials just between those four breaches. I mean, that's bigger than the populations of three major countries. <clears throat> so clearly, the combination of advanced phishing working and the credential being extremely compromisable from a credibility perspective is what happens on the end user side that makes this so successful. Let's look at a couple of application examples. Right, so Office 365, how many of you out there have O365 deployed today? Right, and every time I, I mean, I can stop asking at this point. I used to be able to ask two or three years ago and I would get half the room or a third of the room if people are still considering it. You know, by and large, Microsoft has convinced us all to move to some amount of O365 in the cloud. They report 100 million active users. Again, another tech trend survey came back and said, of the people who responded, 58.4% said, we store sensitive data somewhere in O365. And I'm not saying that's a bad idea, right? It, it lives in email, it lives in SharePoint, it lives in OneDrive, it lives somewhere on a file share within Azure. But those same people who responded said, 50% of them said, we understand we need greater security because of that, we just aren't quite sure what that means to us yet today. Take a look at another example. Portals. Um, to me, it's not just about the authentication. So I read this report earlier this year from Javelin. They, they focused on uh, consumer identity fraud. <clears throat> and some of these things we pulled from the report to me were, were telling. First time ever, more social security numbers were stolen than credit card numbers. Because again, I don't need to have your credit card to monetize you anymore nor do I need to have your credit card information to, to defraud you. I can simply become you from an account takeover perspective with that data, with that PII data, and then open up account, <coughs> excuse me, accounts in your name. So account takeovers or ATOs tripled, resulting in $5.1 billion worth of loss last year. <coughs> and at the consumer layer, paying an average of $290 out of pocket and 16 or more hours on average to resolve their fraud issue. Online shopping, presented the greatest fraud opportunity. I mean, listen, I think we've done ourselves justice in protecting and hardening the point of sale systems and in adding chips to our cards. All we've really done at this point is push the attacker to no card present fraud because we've given them just another avenue that is not nearly as protected as chip. 
the ripple effect, which I didn't read in last year's report that was in this year's report, which I thought was interesting, 200% increase in, in those people who reported, not only did I have an account fraud, but I've had an, an intermediary or a set of secondary accounts open on my behalf that I learned about later, right? So the, the fraud continues um, past the initial account compromise, up 200% from last year. And, and what we've learned from the, from the report and, and what I think we hear our own customers starting to talk about now is, hey, fraudulent registration and self-service password reset um, become the most, uh, become, have become a more popular way of gaining access to someone's account in those portals rather than just cracking that known password at that portal from a compromised perspective. Um, think about how SSPR page, pages are served on the open internet today, right? I can simply hover over that URL to see if you have added any protection mechanism to that SSPR page. For those of you that have not, you become a, a much easier target for those attackers to attempt to then go out and find your data so they can use that data to then go try to reset and own that account from an ATL perspective. In fact, we have customers talking to us more now about applying, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, applying intelligence to SSPR and registration pages for that very reason, from an adaptive access perspective. So what have we as an industry started to try to do about it in the last uh, three to five years is deploy two-factor, right? But what is the conversation we always get into relevant to two-factor? Hey, it might make me more secure, but it makes my end user experience um, frictionful and burdensome. And, and particularly in the consumer world, we're, we're deathly afraid of pushing our consumers to our competitors. So we want as least friction as possible in that experience. So by show of hands, again, for the folks in the room, how many have two-factor deployed in some capacity today? Now, can you keep your hands up if you apply some sort of adaptive intelligence logic to that two-factor? Thanks. So I, I probably have done this talk six times in the last six months. Uh, small groups, whether it's been 12 people at a lunch and learn, um, groups like this, uh, where it's been 20 or 30 folks, uh, I think I did one as, as, as large as um, 150 at a tech IT conference in Chicago last month. And a very similar experience regardless of the size, which I find interesting. About 80% of the room raised their hand at, hey, we do two-factor. I think the hands went down to four when we talked about do you apply any intelligence um, to that second factor request. Um, I, had, I was having a conversation yesterday with Mary Ruddy from Gartner about this very, she sat in my session yesterday, she said, man, that, that trend of the, all the hands to no hands based on adaptive, do you see that often? I said, yeah, I see it every time I talk. Um, I asked her, what do you think drives that? Um, do you think it's that people don't understand the value of adaptive, or are they using adaptive and don't even know it? So I'd like to test that theory here for a second, if that's okay. The folks who had their hands up for two-factor, but then put them back down, do you second factor, just by show of hands, do you second factor every time someone authenticates in most of those scenarios where you've deployed it? Right, so interestingly enough there, only two hands went up. So it tells me she might be onto something in that the rest of you who didn't put your hands back up, you're just tired of me to tell you to put your hands up, or you apply some amount of logic like geolocation or device recognition or something that helps throttle how many times you step people up. So that would, in a, in a sense, be some amount of adaptive authentication, right? You're applying some intelligence to when you determine on placing that second factor forward. Uh, so I would submit, at least from my first trial, <laughs> that maybe it is a, um, hey, we use adaptive, don't, really, don't realize it's called adaptive, or we don't refer to it as adaptive, we just refer to it as a second factor issue. Not really that we don't use any, any layer of adaptive, which is good. Because ultimately, this is what starts to solve the first of the problems I talked about relevant to the increase in security and the enhancement of end user experience. And, and so I'll kind of walk you through what I mean by that so, so we all are on the same page as I move more into how do we apply this even more analytically from a security problem perspective. Starting from the left, pretty standard authentication all the way to the right, very malicious event. The checks and X's in the middle, right, aren't indicative of something our product does or our competitors' products do. It's really about your tolerance for risk, right? You are gonna go in and set policies against these layers to the left that are gonna allow you to say, hey, uh, 
if I have a recognized device, if I have looked up certain attributes in the directory about you, if I know you're coming from a geo location I do business in, maybe even I know you're inside our corporate fence, there's been no geo velocity violation. Um, for those in the room, just make sure you understand what I mean by that is, there's been no miles per hour violation from the first authentication, the last authentication to the next authentication. The IP address has a good reputation from a threat service perspective. And oh, by the way, I, I, I can tell from the mobile device you're using that it hasn't been recently ported. The governance solution says that a recent certification has occurred within the perimeters and time parameters. And oh, by the way, you seem to be trying to do something if in fact we're integrated with a UBA that, that seems normal to you. Guess what, I'm only gonna allow you to come in with the second factor, or sorry, with no second factor. Your primary username and password is, is completely acceptable. You could say, hey listen, if you're coming from a different geo and outside the fence, but everything else about you still seems appropriate, I could still let you in with just that single factor, right? So just allowing based on that credential, because I know it came from a device that you've registered before, I can still validate you in our directory the, the, the IP address you're using is at least uh, has an appropriate IP reputation. Um, the, the phone number you're using from, if you're coming in from a mobile device hasn't been recently ported, et cetera. That would be an acceptable level of deviation where I can still accept that single credential. And then moving further to the right, I start to introduce friction based on what I'm learning, right? So, ah, now a new device and different geo and outside the fence. Well, I might want to step you up now. Moving forward again to the right, from a suspicious perspective, you see more X's. This time it's uh, the threat service came back. Maybe you're using a um, tr um, transparent proxy browser, a browser, or maybe you've came from a known documented Tor exit node. I am now going to step you up, and if I don't get a success, I'm just gonna deny that event, and, and then I can you know, catalog that, send that to the SIM, et cetera. All the way to a malicious event, meaning we know that uh, it's known cyber criminal activity. We, from, the, from the threat feeds we get into our cloud, we're able to apply that logic against where you're coming from or what the IP address is, and, and we know this to be malicious, and so we've just not even bothered to send a step up, we're just outright denying it. That, in a nutshell, is, is adaptive auth and trying to apply that level of friction only when absolutely necessary so that I can have the increase in security and the increase in user experience. So we know that this is having traction and working and here's why, right? So we conducted our own study and I think the stats are worth sharing with folks which is why we have it included here. Over the course of 12 months last year, 573 organizations were represented in our cloud from an anonymous perspective, our customers. 691 million total authentications. Of those, 74 million were stepped up or denied. So just stopping there before I microanalyze the difference in why people got stepped up and, and what we did with that, that alone tells me that 88%-ish of our authentications we allowed in on a single factor, not necessarily because we're some super cool vendor that had some secret sauce like anybody else, but simply because we did enough pre-auth analysis that we felt could be tolerated to, to, to accept that single factor. So of the ones we did step up, 18 million of them were incorrect password. So again, we didn't submit a step up there, right? These are just the steps up or denied, right? Obviously we denied an authentication request that had a bad password. <clears throat> we can't tell in the tool if that bad password was uh, fat fingered or if it was you know, a rainbow tabled attack at, at finding passwords and compromised credentials. We, we can't really tell the difference from that perspective, but we do know that the bulk, of, you know, a good, more than a third of those denials or step ups were just simply caused by password. And then look at the drop off in the rest of the numbers. 329,000 by unrecognized devices, 211,000 by malicious, and then 81 by suspicious. So if we looked at malicious and suspicious denials together, it's only 300K. Essentially it's 0.1% of the overall stepped up traffic, let alone the, the total authentication traffic that we deem to be suspicious or malicious. I mean, isn't that clearly the definition of needle in a haystack, right? I mean, it, it is less than a percent, right? But I would imagine that if any of the recent breaches were up here talking, they would probably be telling you that it wasn't all of a sudden 20% of the traffic became bad traffic and that's how they got attacked. It's that simply they weren't able to detect the, the needles in the haystack which got through and dwelled and lived and 
succeeded in their mission and, and voila, months later they found out they had a breach, right? So to me, this tells us <coughs> we're handling the user experience and security better, but is that really enough? Like, are we, are we applying the levels of analytics from an identity and security perspective enough? And we don't think so. I don't think so. Everything I showed you up to now hasn't reduced dwell time. Like, so for the folks that are actively in, once you start acting more intelligently around identity and security, how are we finding them and reducing their time in? Um, it doesn't address insider threat if I give away my credential or if I use my credential in a malicious way necessarily. Um, how do I detect and prevent that? So if, if days present is still significant, with credentials still being involved in the attack lifecycle somewhere, and the lack of protections aren't at 100% yet across the enterprise, um, and with adaptive intelligence, how do we do this any different so that we can even gain greater leverage from our solution sets? And, and I'll define it today by something we call identity security automation. It is this transformative new approach where we create purposeful, intelligent intersections between identity investments and security investments so that you can gain greater automation as they enrich each other with information. And I'll show you in that same quad chart in a second what that um, greater automation might look like as examples. If you're a security person out there, to you this should say, hey, I can better prevent misuse of credentials and I can better find and reduce dwell time and, and I can create more surgical responses in a more proactive nature based on what we're discovering. I mean, I still think we act in a very reactive posture today and, and we think these integrations from an identity security automation perspective should change our posture from reactive to proactive and I'll talk about how in a minute or why or examples. <coughs> from a business perspective, um, the identity and security domains are being asked to take on more and more of these digital transformation initiatives, which are all supposed to run lean and agile. And, and if you've been in, in identity or security for any amount of years, we don't do many things lean or agile. Yet we're now being asked to, to, to run faster to support the business. The example I gave um, from, from uh, Matt's perspective when he talked yesterday, they're simply buying an app and then coming to him and saying, hey, by the way, can you connect this to, to our known usernames and passwords? Uh, and he wasn't even you know, cognizant a day ago that they had bought the app, let alone prepared for them to say, hey, by the way, can you hook us up and connect us and can we be running tomorrow? So we're all being asked to move much faster. If we create these integrations, it's our opinion that you'll gain adaptability and velocity in those deployments. And, I'll, and again, I think I'll show you why in a minute. So what does identity security automation really do or what does it mean? So if we looked at traditionally how we have deployed within our siloed domains, we've had network security for a long time, we've had endpoint security for a long time, and we've had identity for a long time. <clears throat> it probably hasn't even been until the last year that we've really talked about, is there a way to bring these domains more together in a cohesive manner that would allow this to a stop occurring? Right, this is my virtual attacker, this is him exposing the gaps between, hey, network's doing it this way, and network's talking to network, and endpoint and vulnerability management are doing it this way, and, and they might be reporting on what they're reporting on and finding, and oh, by the way, the identity guys are over there creating users and assigning access, but the three aren't necessarily talking. So we're creating this environment where attackers can live within our gaps. All we're really saying is, hey, leverage the appropriate protocols to share your indicators of compromised data with each other more effectively so that we can make better runtime-like decisions. We all know that all three areas have indicators of compromise on their own, but they're, they're, they're not necessarily aggregating them quickly enough to where any actionable intelligence can be made, right? So I, so I talked already about, hey, look, if I can apply some of these um, external factor logic, uh, your device, your geo, is it inside a fence or outside the fence? Some of the more policy-based things to decide whether you, I can allow you in, are you a good actor? I can hopefully determine pretty quickly whether you're a threat operator. 
<clears throat> it's the unsure, unsafe that are obviously that, what's your tolerance from a risk perspective? If I'm unsure who you are, I should apply friction, or if you're going someplace in my environment unsafe, I should apply friction. <clears throat> the more we can share data and more quickly identify high-risk accounts, devices, behaviors, locations, IP addresses, and events, the greater chance we are of finding risks and threats faster. The more friction we apply, the greater chance those attackers move on. I mean, listen, there are so many organizations that move at so many different levels of, of efficiency and quickness relevant to adopting these things that if you just provide just enough friction, they'll move on simply because they can go find somebody else to attack faster because they aren't applying that level of friction. This, this, these enhanced amounts or measures of security, they don't bother end users. In fact, they probably make the experience better for the end users because you're giving the control to the end users relevant to their authentication choices, their factor choices, and when they apply friction, what kind of friction gets applied. And then ultimately that bi-directional sharing of data, it just creates greater efficiency for your cybersecurity programs altogether. Um, how many of you in here, by show of hands again, sorry, know if, well, so I assume everybody here has a SIM, right? Nobody not has a SIM, all right. How many of you, by show of hands, have identity data correlated in your SIM today? So that's three, how, how long is, so can anyone, longer than a year? Longer than two years? Look at you early adopters. That is probably the, 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 in the last year and a half, the greatest first intersection we're seeing companies take is they're, they're taking all the normal data they've had in their SIM before, and now they're creating a greater degree of fidelity against that telemetry by saying, hey, what else can I learn about this from an identity perspective? Uh, and how do I apply that to these incidents and events I'm trying to manage against? So we've beat up the password. We've talked about having to apply MFA. We've talked through applying standard adaptive controls, as I gave the example earlier. All I'm really suggesting, and that gave people a set of automated actions which, that you guys clearly can't see. <laughs> Again, step up, step down, redirect, or block. All I'm really suggesting now is, um, I think Mary's report last year called it advanced adaptive authentication. All I'm really suggesting is applying greater layers of intelligence through these intersections so then you can take even more automated actions like reset password or suspend access or remove account entitlements or permissions. So you end up with this, right? You end up with what I showed above the line already. Now all of the additional layers from a AI or ML perspective that are much more dynamic um, are, are, are listed as examples here, right? So if I can determine if your account is attached to privileged access, if I can determine um, if the device or the server you're headed to, the endpoint you're headed to uh, is a potentially infected device or exploitable device, Maybe I treat authentication to those devices for some period of time in a more frictionful way. Um, some, of the, some of the current analysis that we're proving today, as an example, says it's completely legitimate for an organization to find out there's a vulnerability uh, for a given software operating system or, or server, and, and then that vendor comes out with a patch. And it's completely appropriate for you as an organization to say, wait, I'm not applying it yet. Like I, it's a revenue generating system. I've got to go into our non-prod environment and test those patches to make sure it's not going to break any customizations. And oh, by the way, our downtime window is scheduled for X, Y, or Z. So there is a legitimate amount of time where your servers live in your environment with this known vulnerability, right? All the while, you know there might be attackers with compromised credentials lurking and searching through your environment. All I'm suggesting as an example in a identity security automated world is your vulnerability management solution informs the access control solution, which servers to be worried about from a health perspective. In turn, the access control solution can look up the users that have access to that server through the identity management integration and determine, ah, here's the list of users I should care about for that server, and I'm now gonna apply MFA against that access until such time that the, the risk of that server goes down. Patches applied, vulnerabilities mitigated, et cetera. <clears throat> 
one example. A second example might be, we do password management today very reactively. I forgot my password, so I click a link. What if through UEBA and a combination of the, the threat information I can receive around authentications, that I can determine through a risk score, this credential is being used in a way that seems to potentially be compromised. What if I could simply then just send a password request to that known user's information? Hey, excuse me, you need to reset your password. I'm gonna suspend access to your account until that password reset. That would introduce a lot of friction to the end user. Suddenly, real Johnny can't do his, his or her job because we've suspended their account. But at the same time, if, there, if, if there's enough activity to tell us that credential has likely been compromised, I'm also immediately stopping the attacker's ability to move with that credential until such time that we believe the password's been reset, the account is stable again, and I can turn access back on. So even applying that level of friction, friction scares most organizations when you say it out loud, wait, I might impact real work at a time when I shouldn't. But at the same time, when you think about how else are we truly going to um, be more proactive in our responses, uh, you, you start to, to come to grips with, hey look, 88 to 90% of my traffic is probably okay anyway and then I'm applying some friction to the 10%, and then the, the less than 1% is what I'm really worried about. So yes, if I have to suspend an account temporarily, I understand why. Because here's what we're trying to get to, right? The old way has been, hey, the attack happens, access is granted, they elevate and escalate and live and move and do what they want for 100 and plus, 150 plus days, you find out, you then spend some time going through the investigation forensically, you then decide what remediation is gonna happen and some action is taken. Then they're sort of out of your environment. All I'm suggesting is if we can appropriately intersect our technologies in a way that says, hey, here's the attack. First of all, access was denied because we're, we're much better at intelligence at point of authentication, but now, I can start sharing information from an automated perspective faster and quicker. And then, oh, by the way, my remediation playbook is easier and my action is taken within a series of days, not a series of weeks. Maybe it's even, you know, at some point a series of hours. All of this is save time, money, and risk. And I know that's an oversimplification, but in reality, the only way we'll ever decrease dwell time or decrease breach percentages is if we can start moving things to the left. And, and, and our opinion is the only way to get to that potential is to have us as vendors, have you as the community force us as vendors to find very bi-directional ways through skim and APIs and, and other standard mechanisms to share data so we can take more actionable um, Intel, take more intelligence and, and, and make more surgical actions as a response to it. So, what can I ask myself from here? How do I know whether I am ready to really start having these identity and security intersection conversations? You have to first be able to ask yourself, you know, am I protecting my assets broadly enough? So. Yes, you've purchased two-factor authentication or MFA to protect your VPN for remote workers. But have you also applied it to O365? Have you also applied it to your portal? Have you also applied it to HR? Have you also applied it to, like, you take a look at your critical access, sorry, your critical assets, and then ask yourself, have you deployed broadly enough? Are you protecting intelligently or are you using simple binary two-factor? I think we discovered here that we thought maybe we aren't, but in reality, we probably are applying some layers of intelligence. Are they intelligent enough? Or is there any sharing already going on? The example there, the identity data into the SOC, for instance. <clears throat> Can I measure attacks at my front door? You know, do you have a way to understand what's happening from an authentication perspective in a dashboard view at your portal point of presence, right? Can you say, statistically over this many days, we've had this many authentications from these regions, these geos, these kind of browsers, et cetera. Do you have any way to start quantifying what the problem looks like from a protections perspective? Have you documented what metrics you would use to measure modern authentication success? So the data that, that our customers see, right, that we see collectively across our customers is 88% of 
Authentication is happening on a single factor. In your deployment, you have to be able to assess what would be success for us. Um, how, how many, you know, what percentage would we want to see step ups and why? Can we assess why they're stepping up? Can we change policies to, to better triangulate why we step up or, or where we provision or deprovision access from? And then ultimately, <laughs> my, you know, question seven, what do I do next, right? And this is just a list of those steps that kind of really go back to answering one through six. Start trying to understand your environment better. Start trying to assess what success would be to you. What is your risk tolerance? You know, what of the, you know, of the picture, what to you means standard? How many X's until it's acceptable deviation and so on and so on. Documenting what that tolerance looks like so you understand how to act accordingly and what actions to take when you're ready to act. How many of you, to yourself, do you talk about identity in your board meetings? Do you talk about identity in your executive meetings? Where, where does identity live in the importance scale? Is it still a, hey, it's a project we always put on the board to get funded and, and sometimes funded, sometimes defunded? Or is it an operational cost at this point and it's all the way to the CIO where we talk about compromised credentials and identities on a, on a regular metrics basis? Do I report health of my identity inside our organization at the executive layers? Which intersections would be meaningful to us and why? Uh, do we have an EM, an enterprise mobility management solution deployed today? And if we do, can we get data from it so that when we're sending that second factor, we can have some greater trust that that device that we're sending to, we know is one of our devices under corporate control. Do we know that that iOS is at its uh, patch and revision level? Otherwise, I may want to remove that as a factor for, for, um, for, for a second factor alternative because I, don't, I no longer trust that device. So what intersections would be meaningful to us as an organization uh, versus, you know, if you go to um, IDSA Alliance, right, so the Identifying Security Alliance that, that's here this week, if you go to their website, I think it's idsalliance.org, you know, they have 14 published use cases today uh, around these different intersections of identity and security. Probably not every one of them meaningful to you, but maybe it's two or four or, or seven, but, but figuring out which products talking to each other would be valuable to you and why and then coming up with some way to document that for your solution providers, us as vendors, for have you tell us, hey, here's what we think is valuable, here's what I own, here's my SIM, here's my MFA product, here's my identity product, do you all talk? I mean, that's the goal of the IDSA, for instance, that's the goal of our Connected Security Alliance, is to have us cooperative, competitive vendors trying to find ways to bring integrations to you that are meaningful. So with that, Questions? My favorite, Vlad, what can I do for you? So I would almost want to ask the two guys to put their hand up <laughs> if they're still here, because I assume that's exactly why they integrated identity data into their SOC. Um, Oppenheimer was probably our first customer that started bringing identity information into their SOC via the SIM. And they were able to look at the composite set of entitlements that a known user might have access to relevant to that event, so they tied the IP address and the device and the user together, and then quickly just determined, hey, these ones matter more because, oh, by the way, there's a set of entitlements that, that are more risky to our organization for these users than here. So just simply prioritizing which events to evaluate first because of identity information was new to them. But in, in their world, if I can quote him correctly from the case study, I think they went from consuming you know, thousands of events per day to focus every hundred they could focus on because of identity information at first. So clearly I think there's tremendous value in bringing UEBA kind of usage statistics around what users are actually doing to the SOC for that same reason as well as their composite view of, of access to the SOC. Any other questions? All right, enjoy the keynote. <laughs>